Welcome to Her Remarkable History. Remember to support, subscribe. The tragic and pitiful execution of the nine-day queen, Lady Jane Grey. When Jane Grey was taken to her death, she was just 17 years of age. She had been queen for only nine days after the death of Edward VI. He had named his Protestant cousin, Jane, his successor, instead of his Catholic half-sister, Mary. A bit of backstory into Jane's life is vital to understand why she had been named Queen by Edward. It was common in Tudor society for aristocratic children to be brought up in other households, especially if the foster family was of a higher status, as this would ensure that children learnt etiquette, were in an adventurous position to find a suitable patron, or to make a good marriage. Fostering such children enhanced a family's influence and their finances, as there was money to be made from matchmaking. When Jane was just ten years old, she was placed into the household of Thomas Seymour. He was ambitious and realised that having Jane under his influence could be extremely profitable. Both Jane and Edward VI were still children, but when they reached maturity, Thomas planned to marry Jane to the king around the same time, in 1547, when Thomas Seymour married Catherine Parr, Henry VIII's widow. Catherine was close to Henry's children and personally oversaw their education. She was a keen Protestant and an educated woman, a patron of the arts and music, and she made sure to share these interests with her stepchildren. Lady Jane Grey had blossomed into an intelligent, cultured and pious young woman, and as third in line to the throne, Jane was a valuable asset especially if she married King Edward VI, so naturally Seymour wanted to keep her close. With the country in religious turmoil, Lady Jane Grey was third in line to the throne, and in a bid to prevent the ascension of the Catholic Mary Tudor, Jane was chosen to succeed the King. Jane was the great-great-granddaughter of Henry VII, and she inherited the crown from her cousin Edward VI on the 9th of July 1553. Edward VI, when he was 16, fell ill with a fever and cough, and from then on his health remained volatile. Worried about the fate of the crown, he wrote his device for the succession. Inspired by his own father's will, it took Edward several drafts to complete. The first version was written before he realised his illness was terminal, and it did not single Jane out as his heir. Edward wanted above all to ensure that his successor was a male Protestant, so he could disinherit his half-sisters Mary and Elizabeth in favour of the male heir of his cousin, Lady Frances Grey, or her children, Jane, Catherine and Mary. But, by the June of 1553, it became clear that the king was fatally ill, and since none of his cousins had yet produced a male heir, he changed his device in favour of Lady Jane Grey. Although Jane would reign as queen, the crown could only follow to a male heir, and if Jane died without sons, then it would go to the sons of one of her sisters. Edward's second version was signed by the Privy Council and at least ten of the courtier's senior lawyers. This new version of Edward's device was highly adventurous to the King's protector, John Dudley, Duke of Northumberland and it may have been all part of his master plan, as earlier that year he had married off Jane to his son, Lord Guilford Dudley, so that when Edward died, the couple would become king and queen. Jane was just 16 years old when she married Guilford, who was only 18 himself. It is important to remember that Jane was a victim of her father's ambitions, and he had arranged for her to marry Lord Guilford Dudley, the son of John Dudley. John Dudley was one of the most powerful men in England at the time. It was then, only three days after Edward had died, that Jane was called upon to accept the throne, and on the 10th of July she was proclaimed Queen. But this was short-lived, as on the 19th of July Mary I was proclaimed Queen, and Jane and Guildford were seen as the enemy and charged with high treason. Jane and her husband were then imprisoned in the Tower of London. Mary I was merciful and granted them a reprieve, allowing the couple to remain as high-status prisoners in the Tower. It is thought that Jane was held at No. 5 Tower Green, whilst the Duke of Northumberland and his four sons, including Guildford, were imprisoned in Beauchamp Tower. Jane had some comforts. She was attended by three gentlewomen and a manservant, and was allowed to walk freely in the Queen's garden at convenient times. 
In the November, the young couple were then tried and convicted of treason at Guildhall. They were both charged with high treason and sentenced to death. But the Queen doubted Jane's guilt and said her conscience would not permit her to have her cousin put to death. But that all changed in 1554. The Queen was a staunch Catholic and she had planned to marry Philip II of Spain who was hated by her country. And this made her deeply unpopular and a series of uprisings followed, including the Protestant Wyatt's Rebellion. The conspirators didn't intend to bring Jane back to the throne, but Jane's father was involved in the plot and put Jane and her husband in a difficult situation. Jane's existence became more of a threat to Mary, who could not afford to let her live. Jane's father's involvement in the rebellion essentially sealed her fate, and all possibilities of a pardon were shattered. Mary did offer to spare the lives of Jane and Guildford if they converted to the Catholic faith. But Jane, always pious, was now a passionately devout Protestant, and they both refused. Then, with great reluctance, Queen Mary I accepted the Privy Council's advice and ordered the execution of Jane and Guildford. Guildford requested to meet one last time with Jane, but she refused, as she felt it would cause less misery and pain if they waited to meet shortly elsewhere and live bound by indissoluble ties. Then, on the 12th of February 1554, at around 10am in the morning, Guildford was taken to Tower Hill, where a crowd was waiting to watch him lose his head, and from her window, Jane then saw his headless body being carried back to the chapel. It is said that she then exclaimed, O oh, Guildford, Guildford! Being a woman of high status, Jane was granted a private execution within the Tower grounds, an hour later. Dressed in black, the young woman remained calm as she walked to the scaffold on Tower Green. Her final words were dignified, and among them she said, Good people, I am come hither to die, and by a law I am condemned to the same. The fact indeed against the Queen's Highness was unlawful, and the consenting the unto by me. I do wash my hands there of any innancy before thee, face of God, and the face of you, good Christian people, this day. I pray you all, good Christian people, to bear me witness that I die a true Christian woman, and that I look to be saved by none other means, but only by the mercy of God in the merits of his only Son, Jesus Christ. And I confess, when I did know the word of God, I neglected the same, love myself and the world, and therefore this plague or punishment is happily and worthily happened unto me for my sins. And yet I thank God for his goodness that he has thus given me time and respect to repent. Lady Jane Grey then read Psalm 51 in her prayer book, and she had asked that the people gathered to assist her with her prayers while I am alive. She would have no prayers said for the dead, a clear demonstration of her faith. After kneeling down, she recited the Psalm of Misery Medus in English, and then she gave her gloves and handkerchief to one of her ladies, and her prayer book to the lieutenant of the tower. The executioner stepped forward to help Jane untie her gown, but she refused, ordering him to leave her, as she preferred the help of her ladies. Her gown, headdress and collar were then handed to her ladies. The executioner then knelt in front of Jane and asked her for forgiveness, which Jane most willingly gave. It was then that Jane, who was directed to the stand, saw the block for the first time. She quickly turned to the executioner and asked that he dispatched her quickly. She knelt down and asked, Will you take it off before I lay me down? To which he responded, No, madam. Jane's ladies by this point were too distressed to help her any further, so the final task of tying the blindfold over her eyes was left for the poor girl to complete herself. Now plummeted into darkness, she began to feel for the block, but unable to locate it, she panicked and cried out, What shall I do? Where is it? But no one, not her ladies, nor the officials, nor the executioner, moved to help her. They were all as though frozen by the heartbreaking and pitiful scene that was unfolding before them. It was then that an onlooker in the crowd stepped forward, possibly appalled by what was unfolding, a scared seventeen-year-old girl, frozen and blinded with fear guided Jane to the block. Jane, then with her head in the curved aperture, spoke her last words, Lord, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Then, with one swing of the axe, 
Jane's life was gone, a young woman with such potential extinguished. Sometime before nightfall, Jane's remains were then buried at the chapel of St Peter ad Vincula, near to those of her husband and the two other fallen Tudor queens, Anne Boleyn and Catherine Howard. Eleven days later, Jane's father, Henry Grey, met the same gruesome end and was buried near his daughter and son-in-law, a tragic family reunion. Thank you for watching and to support, please subscribe to Her Remarkable History. Thank you.